The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Open your Bibles to Hebrews 10. We're in a, looks like a forever study on the new covenant. I thought I, well, it don't, don't matter what I thought, but chapters 8, 9, and 10 have really gone slow. I thought I'd go through this quick on that, but that's fine. I find stuff that's really interesting, and I just stop and stay a while. I'm in verse 5. Now he's, he's into Psalms 40 here, which is Messianic Psalms. I'll tell you why that's important. Let me tell you why this is important. When you find this in the new, under the New Covenant, I got John tells me I have to write bigger. First Corinthians fifteen three and four. What's that tell me? It tells me that, but, but, but there's something specific in there. It says that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and raised from the dead on the third day according to the Scriptures. Well, this is one of those Scriptures because he's talking about the Old Testament in 1 Corinthians 15 because the New Testament hasn't been canonized yet, only the Old Testament. So when he says this according to the Scriptures, he's not referring to the New Covenant Scriptures. He's referring to the Old Covenant Scriptures about the New Covenant. Who are? Nah. I, was, I was watching this, uh, talking about hua. Um, I, I was watching the, uh, them, uh, those um, seals from Thailand recover those kids. And when they got, when they got them all rescued and was out there and they interviewed them, did you hear what they said? Hua. That's where that comes from. Yeah, yeah, they got them all out, which was wonderful. Um, and and listen, they uh, if the new, if I caught the news right, there was a hundred seals showed up from all over. They sent them in there to to assist uh, all all the different nations that had seals. They all sent them in there. Don't you know those guys wanted a piece of that action? I mean, they were built for that action. Yeah. Yeah, America sent a bunch of them over there. But you had to really be tiny. I mean, they were going in small spaces. Our guys probably couldn't go in those spaces. Take take to Thailand, the little thin guys get in and out of there. Well, anyhow, it's just... Te television can be good and evil, and it? <laughs> you know, you turn on one channel, and you see this wonderful thing, and you go like, well, that's good. You turn on another channel, and you go like, well, that's from the pit of hell. So television can an amazing book, amazing thing. But here we are. And so he goes into this discussion, which is important in our lesson. He says, uh, we're, this is, I, of course, I'm in Hebrews 10, 5. When he comes into the world, that's his introduction to this. When he comes into the world, sacrifice and offerings thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. In whole burnt offering, shadow Christology, and sacrifices for sin under Old Covenant, thou hast taken no pleasure. That's really important. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the role of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. After saying, after saying above, sacrifice and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast not desired, nor hast thou taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, now this is important, back to verse 5. Then he said, behold, I have come. See, in verse 5, he said he's coming. Then he quoted this verse about he would come and fulfill Old Covenant sacrifices, shadow Christology, he would bring them to completion. He said, I didn't come to abolish. He came to what? Fulfill. And now, when we get down here in verse 9, he says, 
and what what he said, and he said, behold, I've come to do thy will. See, that's at, that's at verse 7. I have come with a prepared body to be offered as a sacrifice for sin, and it's up to me to complete the mission or do thy will. Then he, in verse 9, he talks about the fulfillment of that of doing the will in regard to his body offers sacrifice for sin in verse 9. Behold, I have come to do thy will. He takes away the first covenant in order to establish the second covenant. That word establish is really important. And so the key here is the body prepared for the sins of the world. He comes in the world. God prepares a body to go to the cross of 1 Peter 2.24. He's going to bear our, the sins of the world on his body, on the, on the tree, on the cross. Well, the two things connected with his body for the sacrifice for sin that are really important to the new covenant theology, virgin birth and impeccability. Impeccability is another word for sinlessness. It's a theological word for it. And I'll try to share with you there is some false teaching connected to that, how far that extends. There are people that think that the sinlessness of Christ extends into the Christian life after he's saved. There's a large denomination that believes that. And, we, you know, we, we want to be sure that we understand what the writer's talking about here, about it. So, last time, we looked at the the sacrificial body of Christ was our title this time, that, and I said I called it part one because we looked at what? Now we've had camp since then, <laughs> and so it was the virgin birth, and we had a wonderful camp this year. We really had a great camp. Everything went good. Kids got saved like they should, were supposed to, <laughs> which is always wonderful. And and I'll tell you. Once again, I went to camp, and I had 14 teens with me in the academy section of the camp. And I tell you, they were lights out. I mean, they, I mean, they would have sat there. I could have taught them till I fell out. They were wonderful. The positive volition of these kids that are freshmen, sophomore, and juniors. The juniors going in to the junior year. Wow, did I get all fired up? I went, oh, Father, I, we've still got some great young people out there. And uh, what a, I just got all fired up again. Camp does that to me. Well, last time we talked about the virgin birth. Now, watch this now. The whole thing is about the cross. On this side of it, we have the virgin birth and then the impeccability. Impeccable. That's the body that's going to hang on that. Here's the body that's prepared. And Jesus Christ keeps that prepared body volitionally. Not my, you know, his whole idea in life was not my, it ought to be ours. We ought to follow in his steps in this regard. Not my will, but thy will be done. Now you got to know his will for it to be in conflict. But let me tell you, as soon as you learn the word of God, as soon as you learn the will of God from the word of God, it's going to come, come in conflict with your will. And then you're going to surrender that, and you're going to learn what it means to walk by faith and see God do miraculous things. Impeccable. He, this is the way he's born. Now watch this now. This is the way he's born. This is the way he lived. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See that word? He who knew no sin. I'm going to show that to you in a little bit in the Greek language. That word no. But here we have the virgin birth. We talked about the first leg, and now we're talking impeccability is the last leg of the mission. Here's the first leg of the mission. Here's the last leg of the mission. And uh, we're going to talk about what, what impeccability means. I mean, how, how do we approach this? 
last time when we looked at virgin birth, we know that there was a key verse for that, Isaiah 7, 14. When that, that's the verse that the Gabriel reminded Joseph about when Joseph about divorced Mary over this child she was carrying. He went, this is, listen, this is a fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14, and her conception is not by a man, it's by the Holy Spirit of God. And so we talked about that last time. I love this thing in Luke. Luke is one of my favorite because he's a physician. He's a doctor. And I just love the way he approached this. He approached this virgin murder. Nobody else approached it like he does. And, and here's what he says. And I like this. Uh, in verse 35, he says. I mean, it just blew it blew, it blew his socks off. This whole thing of virgin birth and him being a medical doctor. He says. He says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. This is Gabriel talking to Mary. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, number one. Watch the second thing he says. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And the third thing he says is that the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And this physician that looked at that went, that's got to be lights out. And so what kind of a child is produced by this? And in, in that same chapter, Luke 1, up in verse 32, uh, when he talks about deity in humanity of the Messiah, deity in humanity, he calls him the son of the most high. See, that's what he did down here when he talked about the power. He says, power, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you and the Holy Child in you will be the Son of God. In verse 32, he said that this, the deity in humanity, which we call hypostatic union in theology, undiminished deity and true humanity in one person forever. Well, I haven't had prayer, have I? No, I can feel my engine. Uh, shall be called the Son of God. But, he, but in verse 32, he's called, he's called the Son of the Most High. I mean, that's. It's hard for the natural man to even grasp that in it. The natural man. Oh, you don't believe that foolishness. I had a professor in school who believed that. He don't believe that foolishness. That's a metaphor. Metaphor. Metaphor him right to the cross. <laughs> oh, I don't know what your metaphor is, but without that, he. He'd have been like the rest of us. Couldn't quite, but anyhow, let's have a word of prayer and I'll, I'll get into impeccable. I give you that moment of silence to believe your priest. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't study it in carnality, evidence of carnality, personal sin. What do I do with that? I confess it. First John 1, 9. If I, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me, restores me to fellowship with the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, and he will teach you all truth and call it to your remembrance. Whew. Mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, and avert sins should be confessed in silence through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2 and prepare you for God to teach you some great marvelous truth about who this person of Jesus Christ is that went to the cross for my sins and God views it as completed when I believe it. Well, Father, we're so thankful tonight for these who have come our way by the Internet and by the automobile. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth about this thing, about the sinlessness of Christ that was necessary for him to bear the sins of the world on the cross. And what do we get from it? We get the great Savior. We get the forgiveness of sin as far as the east is from the west. The scarlet will turn as white as snow. And he will remember our sins no more. Boy, if it, that's a whole lot right there, Father, we're thankful for in our hearts. Rejoice in it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, impeccability. This is the last leg in the qualification for Christ on the cross. Impeccability is kind of a 
fancy word of, of actually breaking it down into simplicity. It means the sinful, sinlessness of Christ is basically what it means. In Hebrews, the fourth chapter 15 on your paper, before I get to point one, it reminds us that the one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. In other words, he didn't have a, a sin nature, but he had volition. And the war for him was the will of God versus his own. And that was a great warfare, yet without sin. In 1 John, the third chapter, verse 5, John writes, he appeared, a historical appearance and completes his mission, he appears in order to take away sins. And then he says, because you know in him there is no sin. And what John is talking about in 1 John is he, he's talking about the unique man of the universe called hypostatic undiminished deity and true humanity and one unique man of the universe. We call that hypostatic union in theology. Well, point number one is to get you an understanding of the definition of impeccability, which is the theological term for this. He's not peccable, but we are. You're impeccable. No, I uh, can't get carried away here. Oh, and, and <laughs> I, I, I did say him. I did what I said. I said him peccable. I did say that. I can say that because Jane's not here and she don't know how to find me on the Internet. So tonight I'm safe. Tell somebody squeals on me. Probably one of my kids who are watching it and immediately right now I have her on the phone. We will begin with a definition of impeccability of Jesus Christ. Impeccability, what it teaches us is that the human nature of Jesus Christ was temptable, but not from the, not from the source or area of the old sin nature like we, but from the area of volition. And that's really important that we understand that. And we call that hypostatic union, uh, it, undiminished deity and true humanity in one unique man of the universe. In, in, in James 1.13, James, which we've, we've read on Sunday, uh, James says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he, he himself does not tempt anyone. And that's really important to understand about Jesus Christ. That's really important to understand about Jesus Christ because he's part of the Godhead. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, which I quoted in my introduction, says that he was, listen, I'll be, listen to be careful, he was able not to sin. And that's because of volition. Could he have sinned? Oh, yeah, volitionally. He was tempted in all ways like we are, yet without sin. See, that's been established with us. So, I want you to see a couple of things in this passage of 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, he made him, talking about God made him Christ. God made, that's the aorist active indicative, and that's important. Made him who knew, there, and there's a definite article that's a participle with a definite article. It's called an articular participle. Now, here's what's important. Now, pay attention. When you have an aorist participle, it's always looking for a main verb, a fi what we call a finite verb. A finite verb is going to be an indicative or an imperative. And I have one. Poyeo. It's an aorist active indicative. Now, here's what this means. It, it, this is really important now in the Greek language because you're not going to see this in English. It means that the act, well, you'll see it in a moment. But the action of the aorist participle precedes the action of the main verb. The main verb is he made. He made him who knew no sin. In other words, he had to be, he had to be without sin when he went to the cross. In order for him to be made sin on the cross. Watch this now. He made him, he, God made his son, who knew no sin. See, that's an heiress participle. 
He made him, listen, he made him who knew no sin, he made to be sin on our behalf. Well, because in the Greek language, the air. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here, here, well, here's what it means. It means that he has to maintain impeccability volitionally to qualify to go to the cross to become sin for the human race. And, and qualify to go to the cross. He's born to go to the cross, but he's got to maintain, volitionally, maintain the mission. And when and if he does, then God will put him on the cross and make him the sin of the world. So he's got to do that. He has got Jesus who knew no sin. God made sin. They, the English don't, the, the English puts it different. The. Apart from a sin nature pull. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's what he says. Yeah, that's why he knows. The writer says of Hebrews, that's why he can sympathize with our weaknesses in regard to sin. And listen to me. And we too can be without sin because God put the third member of the Godhead in our life so that we could, the Holy Spirit, so that we could walk in the power of the Spirit and not in the flesh to sin, right? That's, it's very doable, it, but not in the flesh. It wasn't doable that way with him. He had to maintain volitional contact with the, with the will of God. We have to tap mentally tap in. Yeah. No, it's not. No, it's already done. Yeah. And so there, there's what we have in this verse. Now watch this now. See that. Now remember that this is a definite article participle. The word T-O-N on the front of that, that that's ton. That's a, that's a the. That, that's a. Yeah, that's a that's a definite article which you don't see. He who knew no sin. That's a definite article with a participle. That's an articular participle, which kind of puts a spotlight on it. In the Greek language, it puts a spotlight on it. What do you mean by knew? He who knew no sin became sin. Well, we know we 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 got enough sense to know. Well, he must be talking about volition that he didn't choose it. But here's what the word that's ganasco in the Greek language. This word. New is ganasco. It means to come to know the value of something. It means to come to know the value of something in your life that keeps you in line with, with the will of God. It, it, it sees, he understood the mission here was, was to save the world for all generations. Listen, when he died on the cross, not only did he save the generation now and the generation future, but he completed the generation in the past, Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. Right? They, they were completed in us. The Old Testament people's self redemption was completed when he said, Tataliestai, it is finished in the perfect tense. Boom, it was. See? And all these people were now brought in. And so we have the whole program running. That is so good. I mean, listen, God don't miss anything in your life either. And, and if you'll just let him run it, he'll do good, he'll do good things with your life. You get, while you miss all the kinds of things, you know, I get a grocery list. I always find something I missed. No matter how many times I write it down, I think I know it. I go through and I come out and I go, oh, man, I needed mustard. And who remembers? How many often do you go to the store and buy mustard? Once a year or something? I don't know. Really? I hate shopping. <laughs> Since we're there. <laughs> I'd live at Chick-fil-A three three times a day for sure. No, probably. Load me up with mustard, people. Uh, well, anyhow, um, he made him who knew no sin. 
And it actually should, he, he who knew no sin was made sin. Is that how that really should read? But uh, he made him who knew no sin to be made sin on our behalf so that we might become, this is get on my, see get on my, let me tell you, get on, <laughs> well, it's the word become on your paper. It, it's an aorist passive subjunctive in the aorist tense. This is really important. In the aorist tense, this means to become what you weren't. Yeah, to become something you weren't. To become something you weren't that you would probably never be if this divine intervention had come in your life. You'd probably never married that specific person, right? How many times have you thought about that? <laughs> but there it is, right? There it is. And listen, in the great scheme of things, it's the right thing. I mean, you know, take you a moment, think about that. But in the perfect tense, and the many years ago, this was explained to me um, and it illustrated. It, this word was illustrated out of the Hebrew. Uh, and this, in, in the Septuagint, you know, as the Greek translates the Hebrew, this comes out. When uh, when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and He goes in for Lot and the family, He brings them out, and it says that Lot's wife. You remember she she looked back. She was told not to look back. She looked back. She 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 what? What? You know what she? What, you know what it says though? It says she became a pillar of salt. And that word. Just like this word in the in the Greek part of that, when it puts it like in the Hebrew, it's a perfect. But in the Greek, it's an aorist, a completed kind of thing in the past. She becomes something. She became something she wasn't intended to be. She became something she wasn't. And that, that's the way this word works in the English language, in the aorist tense. So watch this now. Because this is pretty good stuff I'm giving you. This is, this is just like dessert now. You know, you're going through the full meal. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, was made sin on our behalf, so that, here's the divine purpose, so that we might become something we weren't, which is the righteousness of God in Christ. You know how we got that? A gift, right? A gift. God's grace. Whew. Therefore, coming back to imp impeccable, therefore his evil temptation came from outside of himself. Watch this now. Did you miss that? Get your head back in here. Bring it back. Therefore, his evil temptation, it can't come from inside, right? God, God's not tempted in and out. Listen, so it has to come from the outside. Therefore, his evil temptation came from outside of him, like in Matthew 4. How does that work? Remember in Matthew 4, he's about to go in his ministry, goes off for 40 days, right? And then he, he's hungry and everything, he's, and he goes through three, three testing with uh, the, the devil, you know? And he, he, he beats him every time with the word of God. It's the only time you ever beat the devil. He'll beat you to death if you don't know the word of God. And listen, he's not after what you don't know. He's after what you do know. Well, they had the word of God. Yeah, they had the word of God. Yeah, yeah, they had the word of God like you and I. They had the word of God. But here's Jesus in Matthew 4. This is the man. The devil, devil comes up and, listen, he's not intimidated by anybody. He's so arrogant, right? Arrogant people are never intimidated by anybody, not even themselves. Those with merely want to fight. Right? Look in the mirror. They they have a hard time shaving because they want to smash that guy. <laughs> you enjoying this, Mike? <laughs> if you are, then I am. So that a divine purpose, so that we might become what we weren't, the righteousness of God in Him. What we're talking about in this passage. 
of him who knew no sin became sin for us is the sinlessness of Jesus Christ to go to the cross. I, listen, another passage that goes up here, like in, in that, is Isaiah 53, 6. Is there a passage in this? Oh, yeah. Now, I'm not going to read it, but in Isaiah 53, 6 is like when he's a reference to that 1 Corinthians 15, according to the scriptures, there it is. Matthew 4 is one of our passages that, that teach about the temptation. His temptation was to get him, watch this now, the devil, this is what he's after with you and I. Listen, he, he dogs us too. He dogs us. Listen, but he's a wimp. He's a, he's a true wimp. This he is. His temptation was to get Jesus to act independent of his deity in the human working his humanity against the will of God. I mean, he's stupid, in a brick. he's stupid as a brick, but he's as bold he's as bold as anything you can imagine. Hey, listen, listen me tell you why he's so desperate. He's got nothing to lose because he's already he's already been judged to the lake of fire. He's got nothing to lose. He's got nothing to lose. And listen, the warfare is over you and I. The warfare is over you and I and our mind, where we put our mind, where we put it, whether we put it in the will of God or put it in the will of man or whatever we do, the will of this world. It's all about, it's all about, and you can see what he's after with Jesus. You know what the end of this whole thing of Matthew 4 was about? To, to, to get him to worship him. He hit him three times, and the whole point, his goal, what was Satan's goal? Get Jesus to worship him. That cross is no longer up. He's a slug. Devil's just, you know, he goes around with a roaring lion with no teeth. Jesus pulled all of his teeth out at the cross. He pulled every tooth he had in his mouth out. He just goes around and goes, rrr, rrr. And you go like, uh, get out of here. Slap you. So how important is this? When Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane says, not my, you know, and he's going through the Gethsemane warfare. You remember that? Hmm? Listen, the Gethsemane warfare was a lot harder than the wilderness warfare. I mean, he tells you himself. He didn't say he, I mean, he just whipped the, he, he whipped out the sword on him and run him off. The word of God will run the devil off from your life. But boy, in Gethsemane, he was talking about the cup, wasn't he? The cup that you and I drink at the Eucharist. There's where the real warfare went. 1 John 4, 14, we have seen and testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. When he comes out of the grave on the third day, he is the Savior of the world. And let me tell you, the resurrection got me. I saw three men die on the same hill the same day with the same crime as an unbeliever and closed the book. <laughs> that was so stupid. That was the book. The guy died. I went, that's done. Didn't read the last two chapters when he was raised from the dead. When I went back and read it, I went, holy cow, this guy got raised from the dead. Well, that's something to think about. Him dying for a, a human cause didn't seem too much for me. Being raised on the third day as he predicted from the dead. Hey, I got to do this. It sounds like Roy, something Roy Roger, Tom Mix would do right there. Yeah, I know you don't know any of those people. We are made, listen, why do we have to be made? Through his sin, we, we, we become the righteousness of God. You know why? Write this down. I'm going to tell you why. Why him going to the cross, and when we believe it, we become the plus R of God. You can never lose that plus R of God because it's a gift. Romans 3.10. Anybody know what Romans 3.10 says? <laughs> that was quick. I mean, that was such a quick response. You're supposed to play a little poker. Play better poker than that, babe. You got to play a little better poker than that. Don't, don't give your hand away that quick. How about this? There is none, not one. There are none righteous. No, not one. I, I know. Well, the Holy Spirit's better. The Holy Spirit's better than both of us. His job is to recall. 
a lot of times we just jumped, jumped the gun on him and he'd say, why don't you ask me? I told you. <laughs> right? Yeah, well, let's remember that. Here's number two. Impeccability or the sinlessness of Jesus Christ was required to become the sacrificial offering of the body for the sins of the world. Romans 8, 3 and 4. For what the, that should be the law, not he. What the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that, divine purpose, the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. They're all fulfilled in his work. Uh oh. I don't know what that was. Uh, that was a very good one. Uh, uh, so that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not, watch this, uh, fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You know, next to my salvation, probably no other doctrine or truth I ever got other than my security of my salvation was learn, learning how to walk in the Spirit, not the flesh. I mean, that was revolutionary to my, my life. It, and it, was, it wasn't easy to learn. I mean, it was easy to learn and not to live. <laughs> I could drop in the flesh so quick it would scare me, which I never knew until I knew about the Holy Spirit. I thought living in the flesh was normal, and I thought this Christian life is going to be a real struggle. And I found out then the Holy Spirit, and I went, oh, wow, he's even taking care of that. Thank you, God. Uh, the Levitical law of animal sacrifice. Here's some re good reading for some of you. Uh, Leviticus 22, 17 through 25. We're not going to read it. But 1 Peter 1, 19 comes from it. 1 Peter 1, 19. It says that Jesus Christ as a sacrificial lamb uh, was offered without blemish and spot. It, it, without blemish and spotless. Th that goes back to animal sacrifice. I just normally say without growth defects, without birth defects, and without growth defects. And that's dealing with virgin birth and impeccability. That comes out of Leviticus. It comes out of shadow Christology theology. It comes out of Leviticus 22, 17 through 29. Verse 20 says, whatever has a defect, you shall not offer, for it will not be accepted for you. I'm just telling you where the background of this comes from, the scriptures. Jesus subordinated his deity to the Father's will and offered himself for the sins of the world. And Paul goes into the theology of this, which is really deep theology, in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And sometime I'll pull that out and we'll just go and crank that thing down because you people are able to swallow it. That's, that's good steak stuff that you could eat. Uh, three, the impeccability or sinlessness of the humanity of Christ is not imputed to the church age believer. It's his and his alone. You understand that? I can't tell you how many people don't understand that. Back many years ago, Mike and I and a bunch of people we went over to Mississippi to a place called French Camp. Had a big meeting over there. I, I never paid attention. I don't know, know, know enough about denominations, which is good for me. I don't know enough about them to talk about them. So I wind up, I would wind up going to places that were denominational. I knew nothing about the theology. I didn't really care, but I went in and preached what I knew to be true and then took the consequences for it later by not knowing what these people actually believed. And I got with a group of people over there, a mainline denomination that believed that you were sinless in your salvation. And, and I taught on this very subject. And boy, did they, did they want for me. Um, but, but they did pay us, and that was good. They, they, they kicked me out, but they paid me. But. Because they did not believe that they could, that they, they thought the salvation, the sinlessness of Christ was imputed to the you at salvation. And I would try to tell them, I said, well, what about your sin nature? What, what, I mean, 
Do you not know we have a sin nature? You have flesh till you die. Do you not? Do you not understand that? And they went, I, I don't know. I don't. You know, people don't want me. I, I don't hang around. Um, but we did get a, get a couple of days in. I don't know. After salvation, the church age believer still has an old sin nature. That's the clue that you're not sinless because you have a sin nature. And when you take Galatians 5, 16 and 17 and compare it with James 1, 14 and 15, uh, which I did at that camp and and stirred up a hornet's nest. Um, which I thought everybody would accept the Bible as, as, at least to hear it. But that's not always true. But God sends you some strange places, doesn't he? Doesn't God send you some strange places or, or, or meet some strange people? I mean, look, look, you're here. You're here. I mean, and, and, and listen, it's all a good thing in, in the end. I mean, you, sometimes you don't like what you're going through, but in the end you go like, that was a wonderful experience. I would have never realized this had I not gone there and had that and had them rebel against it. I would have never known. So, you would have thought I would pay more attention to other what other people thought, but I never did. I still don't know what other people believe because I don't care. You know, I, I don't want to be in, by this. I mean, I don't want to be influenced by it not to do what I feel God wants me to do. I don't want to be influenced. By it, so I still don't know what other people believe. I just know what I believe. I mean, I can't. I, but anyway, um, he is. After salvation, a church, I believe, has a sin nature. He is not regenerated, regenerated into a sinless state. He has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead. And he is, listen to me, watch this now. In Christ, positionally, he is sinless. In Christ, positionally. And when he dies, he'll be that. But in this flesh, you have it at birth, and you, get, you have it till death. And, and it's a reflection of your sin nature. And you're, you're capable of sinning. You're capable of being angry or, or talking or bad-mouthing people, whatever. In Christ, positionally, positionally, what he, the work he did on the cross positionally is yours, just like it went back and picked up everybody over here, right? It's a completed. Your redemption is completed. And positionally, you are sinless because God remembers your sin, what? No more. So in that sense, and when they got all fired up, I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I understand positionally that in Christ we are sinless in Christ, but we're still here. We have a sin nature. So what are we going to do with that? You got the book of Romans, the book of Galatians, I mean, Ephesians, Colossians. What are you going to do with these books? Can't take them all out. Can't throw them away. I don't know. And so we, we have verses like 2 Corinthians 5.21. We have Hebrews 9, 12 through 14, verse 28, just to give an example of a few that I wrote down. Every church-age believer begins the Christian way of life, that's CLW, the Christian way of life as a, believe, as a baby believer in 1 Peter 2.2 2, and, and is on milk, Hebrews 5.13. He is commanded, however, to grow. He's commanded. A present active imperative, second person plural. Now, you can't command a baby. So we're talking about a person who is now gone off from the milk and is in, in immaturity. And, he, and he's given this command. And from that command, we live forever. I mean, you, you can't command a baby. A, command, a baby commands you that he's hungry. <laughs> right? You, you mamas know that. He is commanded, however, to grow, present active imperative, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, in grace and knowledge. And this grabbed me several years ago, and it grabbed me. What does it mean to grow in grace? Now, it made sense. I knew knowledge because I knew your baby and then immature and mature and all that. I had that down because it said under Bob, and he makes that very clear. What wasn't really clear to me other than a definition was how does... How do you grow in grace? 
And so I sat down and began to look at the different stages in my life and what the Bible talked about, and I came up with six stages of grace. And I'll tell you, it was an absolute important outline for me because I saw that I have saving grace, I have logistical grace, I have living grace, I have uh, growing grace, like here, I have suffering grace, I have dying grace and surpassing grace. And for me, I had now, I, I'm a guy that has to, I have to have a roadmap. I got to have a roadmap. I, once I see that, uh, once I get that laid out in my life, now it makes sense to me, grow in grace. Now I got six areas that are really important in my life as I, I'm going to these areas of my life. These are the areas of my life I'll be in that they're important. When I get into suffering, it's important for me to understand how grace See, each of these just carry all kinds of doctrines, people. The, the first thing is to find a system and then work that system. And many of them. So for me to grow in grace and knowledge, understanding is so, you know, you grow in your baby and then immature and then mature into the super grace uh, avenue of your life. That just... I had that, and I said, there's got to be a way for me to be able to figure that thing out and put it in some kind of categorical thinking that could help me understand how to grow in grace in specific areas of my life. Now, there's probably more, but I had to have an outline, and that outline has really helped me in my Christian life and may, maybe help you, okay? Because look, to grow in knowledge, I, I found out I had to be really secure in my salvation doctrines to get out of baby. Then I found out I needed basic doctrines in my Christian life. What are the essential Christian doctrines? Like once I got secure myself, how about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and how it works? How do you how do you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit? How does that mechanically work? How do you how do you live by faith? I struggled with that for a pretty good while until I discovered that there was actually a system in there. And I call it the faith cycle. That was that's the way my brain thinks. I have to think categorically in order for that stuff to work. And so I have to I have to be able to kind of look on a wall and say, well, that's the clock. Here's how it works. <laughs> you know. And so for me, I, I'm, I'm a mechanical kind of guy that way. Uh, I don't do well when just nebulous stuff. You just throw something out there. And it's like spaghetti on a wall or something. You know, it, you may know it's cooked, but I don't want to eat it. You know, people go, they think, throw it on the, board, on the wall and say, well, it's ready to eat. And I go, don't ever do that in my house. And who's going to eat that now? I mean, how much of that are you going to throw on the wall? Uh, I don't know. I don't wear that tradition. But, but anyhow, there's basic doctrine. Then we call advanced doctrines as you get to mature believers. They operate under a whole different uh, shoot match as far as knowledge. And then listen, when you hit super grace, there's a whole nother set of knowledge for you. Well, I'm telling you. So I, I just find it. The goal of spiritual growth is to be conformed to the image of Christ, right? Romans 8, 29. What is the goal in all this? Grow in grace. Grow in knowledge. We're commanded to do it. What's the goal? See, that's, that's another way. I mean, I don't, I'm not nutty about that. Okay, I'm going to run where? Well, let's go for run. Like run where and how long? <laughs> I go, go, just run. Let's run to the store. You know, people, that's the way people talk down here, run to the store. They don't really, really mean run, do they? See, when I came down here, I thought they meant run to the store. <laughs> and then they would say things like, I'll pack you, I'll tote you. I don't know what they were talking about. How do you tote somebody to the store? You can put me on your back. So, so I, I'm just a curious person. I, I, I got to know what we're talking. We're actually going to ride or we're going to run. Okay. Come on, we'll run down to the store. I don't want to run down. What, how, what store and how far? And they go like, ha, ha, you're funny. I go like, well, okay. I just think running means running. I don't know what it means. So the goal for me, uh, what is the goal? If you tell, if I'm commanded to grow in grace and, and knowledge, what's the goal? I mean, what, what is, what's the deal? Well, I'll tell you the bottom line. I'm a bottom line guy. The bottom line is to conform you to the image of Christ. And so for me, what I'm always looking for in my life 
Now, I don't look for it in other people's life, believe me, so don't worry. I don't look for it there. I'm, I'm busy finding it in my own life. I'm paying attention how much of me is being reflected of Christ rather than Ron. In, in my interpersonal relationships, in the way I conduct myself, in, in the way I think, that all should be changing in my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess that's what if it, I guess that's what I'm saying. I'm not quite sure what I'm saying. Because of the old sin nature, the church age believer is peccable and temptable. James 1, 14 and fifteen. So we always remember that because there's some people don't believe that. Uh, the the believer's volition must be kept on a continuous subservient direction to the to the directive will of God. I mean, this is what Jesus did. He, I mean, he lived. That's how he got there. He lived in this idea of the will of God. What is the will of God? What's the Bible say? Why do you want to know? Because I want to know what the will is. Right? What's the Bible say? To show us how to have victory in the angelic conflict, Jesus Christ partook of human flesh and blood. And he says, hey, he was tempted in all ways as we are. It's regard to the, 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 the will of God side of it, not the flesh, not the sin nature side of it, because he said, I was tempted the way I've been tempted in my life. That's for sure. All right? But I do know what he's talking about. He's talking about the divine will side of it. Therefore, since children share in flesh and blood, he himself like, likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the, the power, I don't even know what I wrote here, who had the powerless, <laughs> who had the power, anyhow, the devil who has the power over death, uh, please read that for yourself, Hebrews 2.18, because I don't know. Just read Hebrews 2.18, it'll make any sense. He, and then, of course, Hebrews 14, we already read. Philippians 2, 6 and 7, who, although he exists in form, I tell you, boy, don't try to get into Philippians 2 until you get some of these th other things under you. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard himself equal, did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, kenosis, emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Woo, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of the cross, uh, uh, to the point of death, even the death on the cross. That is to the point of the will of God is supreme in his life over any other things. The will of God is supreme over your life. And I'll tell you, when that's true on a consistent basis, you know you're in high cotton. It's spiritually speaking. Uh, this, uh, do you have 1 Peter 2.21? Okay, I have. Okay. For you have been called for this pur purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving, since Christ also, watch it, you've been called for this purpose. Now, another way of saying that, you've been saved for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, Leaving you an example. Look at the word you. You ought to circle those. For you have been called for this person since Christ all suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his ways who committed no sin nor was deceit found in his mouth. Now, how can you do that? Tell me how you can do that. Walking in the power of the Holy Spirit by the will of God. I mean, the combination of walking walking by means of the Holy Spirit and the application of, of proper categorical doctrine to the situation is dynamite. It's dynamite uh, for the Christian life. Well, there you go, guys. Impeccability. Yeah. Listen up, guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've been there and done that. We all do that, don't we? Yeah. Absolutely. It's a, it's a choice. All right, guys. Uh, let, me have, let, let me have a word of prayer. What? Oh, yeah, we're about to have it. I'm just closing out my book here, starting a new chapter. Here, here we go. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll do our prayer time together. Well, we've got a lot on the plate here to pray about. Father, we're so thankful for this time together with those on the Internet and the automobile. We've looked at the impeccability or the sinlessness of Christ and how important it is to our life and how God has prepared us to be able to live that life under the power of the Holy Spirit by the Word of God. Two important walks. Walk by means of the Holy Spirit and walk by faith. And so, Father, we've, we've tried to lay this out the best we could. And certainly with this congregation that's attended here tonight, we're so thankful for their presence and, and for their participation. What a wonderful, what a wonderful class. We pray the same, Father, over this prayer, over the life of those who are attending with us and, and going through spiritual growth momentum. Pray, Father, that they would stay with us on Tuesday night. Make Tuesday night a special night for study with us, for we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.